All right, part two of the videos. Here we go. Dude, was, well, we're at the part where his brother was going to leave him in the barn unless he touched his the casket that his dad had made for him. Doodle was frightened of being left. Don't leave me, brother, he cried, and he leaned toward the coffin. His hand trembling reached out, and when he touched the casket, he screamed. A screech owl flapped out of the box into our faces, scaring us and covering us in Paris with Paris green. Doodle was paralyzed, so I put him on my shoulder and carried him down the ladder, and even when we were outside in the bright sunshine, he clung to me, crying, Don't leave me. Don't leave me. When Doodle was five years old, I was embarrassed at having a brother of that age who couldn't walk, so I set out to teach him. We were down in an old woman's swamp, and it was a spring, and the sick, sweet smell of bay flowers hung everywhere like a morning song. I'm going to teach you to walk, Doodle, I said. He was sitting comfortably on the soft grass, leaning up against the pine. Why? he asked. I hadn't expected such an answer, so I won't have to haul you around all the time. I can't walk, brother, he said. Who says so, I demanded. Mama, the doctor, everybody. Oh, you can walk, I said. I took him up by the arms and stood him up. He collapsed onto the grass like a half-empty flour sack, as if he had no bones in his little legs. Don't hurt me, brother, he warned. Warned. Shut up. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to teach you to walk. I heaved him up again, and again he collapsed. This time, he did not lift his face up out of the rubber grass. He just can't do it. Let's make honeysuckle wreaths. Oh, yes, you can, Doodle, I said. All you got to do is try. Now, come on. I hauled him up once more. It seemed so hopeless from the beginning that it's a miracle I didn't give up. But all must have something or someone to be proud of, and Doodle had become mine. I did not know then that pride, that pride is a wonderful, terrible thing, a seed that bears two vines, life and death. Every day that summer, we went to the pine beside the stream of an old woman's swamp, and I put him on his feet at least a hundred times each afternoon. Occasionally, I became too discouraged because it didn't seem as if he was trying, and I would say, Doodle, don't you want to learn to walk? He'd nod his head and say, Well, if you don't keep trying, you'll never learn. Or I'd say, Well, if you don't keep trying, you'll never learn. And then I painted for him a picture of us as old men, white-haired, him with the long white beard and me still pulling him around in the go-kart. This never failed to make him try again. Finally, one day, after many weeks of practicing, he stood alone for a few seconds. When he fell, I grabbed him in my arms and hugged him, our laughter pealing through the swamp like a ringing bell. Now we knew it could be done. Hope no longer hid in the dark palmetto thicket, but birched like a cardinal in a lacy toothbrush tree, brilliantly visible. Yes, yes, I cried, and he cried too and the grass beneath us was soft and the smell of the swamp was sweet. With success so imminent, we decided not to tell anyone until he could actually walk. Each day, barring rain, we, sne uh, we sneaked into Old Woman's Swamp, and by cotton-picking time, uh, Doodle was ready to show what he could do. He still wasn't able to walk far, but he we could wait no longer. Keeping a nice secret is very hard to do, like holding your breath. We chose to reveal all on October 8th, Doodle's sixth birthday, and for weeks ahead, we mooned around the house, promising everybody a most spectacular surprise. Aunt Nisi said that uh, after so much talk, if we produced anything less than tremendous than the resurrection, she was going to be disappointed. At breakfast on our chosen day, when Mama and Daddy and Aunt Nisi were in the dining room, I brought Doodle to the door in the go-kart, just as usual, and had them turn their backs making them cross their hearts and hope to die if they peeked. I helped Doodle up, and when he was standing alone, I let them look. He wasn't, there wasn't a sound as Doodle walked slowly across the room and sat down at his place at the table. And then Mama began to cry and ran over to him, hugging him and kissing him. Daddy hugged him too. So, <clears throat> so I went to Aunt Nisi, who, thinks pr or who, who, was, who was thanks praying in the doorway, and began to waltz her around. We danced together quite well until she came down on my big toe with her brogans, hurting me so badly I thought I was crippled for life. Doodle told them it was I who had taught him to walk, so everyone wanted to hug me, and I began to cry. What are you crying for, asked Daddy, but I couldn't answer. They didn't know that I did it for myself, that pride, whose slave I was, spoke to me louder than all their voices, 
and that was dude or and that doodle walked only because I was ashamed of having a crippled brother. Within a few months, Doodle had learned to walk well, and his go-kart was put in the barn loft. It's still there, beside his little mahogany coffin. Now we roamed off together. Resting often, we never turned back until our destination had been reached, and to help pass the time, we took up lying. <laughs> From the beginning, Doodle was a terrible liar, and he had got me in the habit. Had someone or had anyone stopped and listened to us, we would have been sent off to Dick's Hill. My lies were scary, involved, usually pointless, were involved and usually pointless, but Doodles were twice as crazy. People in his stories all had wings and flew wherever they wanted to go. His favorite lie was about a boy named Peter who had a pet peacock with a 10-foot tail. Peter wore a golden globe that glittered so brightly that he walked through the sunflowers. They turned away from the sun to face him. When Peter was ready to go to sleep, the peacock spread his magnificent tail, enfolding the boy gently like a closing to go to sleep flower, burying him in gloriously iridescent wrestling vortex. Yes, I must admit it. Doodle could beat me at lying. Doodle and I spent lots of time thinking about our future. We decided that when we were grown, we would live in old woman's swamp and pick dog tongue for a living. Beside the stream, he'd plant. He'd, we'd build us a house of whispering leaves and swamp birds would uh, be our chickens. All day long, when we weren't gathering dog tongue, we'd swing through the cypresses on the rope vines. And if it rained, we'd huddle beneath an umbrella and tr our umbrella tree and play stick frog. Mama and Daddy would come and live with us if they wanted to. He came up with the idea that uh, he could marry Mama and I could marry Daddy. Of course, I was old enough to know that this wouldn't work out. But the picture he painted was so beautiful and serene that all I could do was whisper, yes, yes. Once I had succeeded in teaching Doodle to walk, I began to believe in my own infallibility. Infallibility means his own, uh, he, he can't make mistakes. And I prepared a terrific development program for him, unbeknownst to Mama and Daddy, of course. I would teach him to run, to swim, to climb trees, and to fight. He too now believed in my infallibility, so we set the deadline for these accomplishments less than a year away when it had been decided Doodle could start school. That winter we didn't make much progress, for I was in school and Doodle, Doodle suffered from uh, one bad cold after another. But when spring came, rich and warm, we raised our sights again. Success lay at the end of summer like a pot of gold, and our campaign got off to a good start. On hot days, Doodle and I went down to the Horsehead Landing and I gave him swimming lessons and showed him how to row a boat. Sometimes we descended into the cool greenness of Old Woman's Swamp and climbed the rope vines or box scientifically beneath the pine where we had learned to walk, where he had learned to walk. Prongmas hung about us like the leaves, and wherever we looked, ferns unfurled and the birds broke into song. That summer, the summer of 1918, was blighted. In May and June, there was no rain, and the crops withered, curled up, and then died up, uh, under the thirsty sun. One morning in July, a hurricane came out of the east, tipping over the oaks in the yard and splitting the limbs of the elm trees. That afternoon, it roared back out west, blew the fallen oaks around, snapping their roots and tearing them out of the earth like a hawk in the entrails of a chicken. Cotton balls were wrenched from the stalks, and lay like green walnuts in the valleys between the rows while the cornfield leaned over uniformly so that the tassels touched the ground. Doodle and, I, Doodle and I followed Daddy out into the cotton field where he stood, shoulder sagging, surveying the ruin. When his chin sank down onto his chest, we were frightened, and Doodle slipped his hand into mine. Suddenly, Daddy straightened his shoulders and raised a giant knuckly fist, and with a voice that seemed to rumble out of the earth itself, began cursing heaven, hell, the weather, and the Republican Party. Doodle and I, prodding each other and giggling, went back to the house, knowing that everything would be all right. And during that summer, strange names were heard through the house. Chateau Thierry, Amiens, Sosasons. And in her blessings at the supper table, Mama once said, and bless the Pearsons, Pearsons, who boy Joe was lost at Bellawood. They're talking about World War I. 
So we came to that clove of seasons. School was only a few weeks away and Doodle was far behind schedule. He could barely clear the ground when climbing up the rope vines and his swimming was certainly not passable. We decided to double our efforts to make the last drive and reach our pot of gold. I made him swim until he turned blue and row until he couldn't lift an oar. Wherever we went, I purposely walked fast and although he kept up, his face turned red and his eyes became glazed. Once he could go no farther, he collapsed on the ground and began to cry. And we'll start this next part, part three.